Love is in the air and enamel pins are in our merch store. Snag yourself a seasonally appropriate pack of Eros and Psyche and revel in the sparkliness of their glittered enamel wings. God, it's so shiny. Available for a limited time, link below. It's impossible to be correct about everything all the time, but in those rare fleeting moments when our human shells fail us and the feeble chains of our mortality hold us back from complete factual accuracy, we all have a responsibility to acknowledge our mistakes, make up for them how we can, and resolve to be better. For instance, I recently dove into the wacky and wild field of linguistics and discovered that I can't read the International Phonetic Alphabet to save my useless ass, as I mistakenly mispronounced the name of Venice in its local Venetian language. I know, what a dumbass. It should be something like Venice but I instead called it Venisa. Oh no! <laughs> Oh no indeed, me from a month ago, you were wise beyond your years. Now as penance for my callous blunder, I promise you won't hear a peep out of me about Venice until I learn enough to write a book on it. But that's just one example, as the real subject of today's video is the Leaning Tower of Pisa, a building I have gleefully dunked on in the past. Because, well, look at it. Can't even stand up straight, dummy. But no more! I'm here to admit I was wrong. I have grown, learned, honed my eye for architecture, and I'm ready to say that it's actually a very well-designed building. So, to atone for my lack of taste and uncover the story of Italy's most memed on tower, let's do some history. Now, the name Pisa derives from the Latin Pisae, and is suspected to come from the Etruscan word for mouth, as it sits right at the mouth of the Arno River, right by the Tyrrhenian Sea. And this aquatic access went to good use, as Pisa was among Italy's premier maritime republics from the 10 to 1200s, alongside Ancona, Amalfi, Genoa, and... Uh, Lagoon Town. <laughs> Those last two effectively owned the Mediterranean by the 1300s, but the early centuries were an intense competition for military and mercantile power. In 1060, Pisa scored a victory in their first major battle with Genoa, and followed up on that win by muscling into the Adriatic Sea to challenge the Lagoon Boys. Like its fellow merchant republics, many of Pisa's big payouts came not from trade, but from raid, as they were enthusiastic participants in the First Crusade, happily carting off plunder from Byzantine islands and Levantine cities on their way to Jerusalem, and then making off with shiploads of treasure from their quick jaunt over to the Moorish Balearic Islands in 1115. And no small amount of that cash took shape in the city's architecture. Befitting their new prominence as seafaring big boy and coming off the recent high of walloping Genoa for the first time, Pisa began construction of a centerpiece cathedral in 1063. This church was big and was notably outside the old city walls, so they were confident. <laughs> Gosh, kicking Genoa's ass must have been one heck of a thrill. So what were they so excited to build? Well, in the 8 to 1100s, the vogue of the day was Romanesque, a medieval style of church design loosely inspired by Roman architecture, hence the name, and characterized by the use of round arches, thick load-bearing walls, small windows, and minimal ornamentation. There's more to it than that, and several distinct regional varieties of Romanesque which make categorizing it more vibes than strict science, but whether you're looking at French or German or Italian or or anyone else's, there's a general simplicity to them. Now, let me say this nicely, you can usually kinda tell that given the technology and techniques available for the time, this is all they had in the tank to design. <laughs> all the height, detail, and general pointiness of Gothic architecture was still down the line, locked in the tech tree behind flying buttresses and gargoyles for Batman to brood on. But credit to 11th and 12th century Pisa, in designing their new church piazza, they wrung every last drop of ornamentation out of Romanesque borrowing elements from mainland Italian design as well as some Byzantine touches and springing for the exceptionally expensive flourish of cladding their masonry in sheets of marble. This all served to mark Pisa's status as an Italian merchant republic with close ties to the Byzantine East and plenty of cash to spend on their prestige. The overall effect on the cathedral is really quite gorgeous. A grand cruciform church dressed in banded white and gray marble with rows of columns built into the side walls and a freestanding colonnade across the facade, all of which is topped by an understated but still very good dome. It's all elements that had been used before, but never together and never this nice. I have far fewer nice things to say about the baptistry across from the cathedral, which... Mm, oh God, where to start? First of all, the proportions are whack. It's as tall as the church and nearly as wide, and the dome is absurd. It's a cone with a smaller normal dome around the bottom. Pick one. And yeah, I'll say it, that's a boob! I see you, famous father-son team of Pisan architect Nicola and Giovanni Pisano, who took over the project after the original architect Dioti Salvi designed the first level. You coarse perverts, keep it to yourself! This isn't a good dome, this isn't even a dome! This is... just... don't! Ugh!
Then, the third to arrive in Pisa's so-called Piazza dei Miracoli, or Square of Miracles, was the Campanile, the bell tower, the soon-to-be leaning tower with dubious attribution but most likely designed by Diotti Salvi. That authorship is based on the design's affinity to another tower in Pisa, a lovely stone-built bell tower at San Nicola, which I literally gasped when I saw this, is also leaning! On the one hand, I feel so bad for him, but on the other hand, we cannot keep letting him get away with this. Perhaps God chose to spite Pisa for its crime against domes, but in any case, the main campanile was cursed to take two centuries and just be a mess. Construction began in 1173, and even in the first three and a half stories, it became obvious the building's foundations were nowhere near enough for the weight and soil conditions. Essentially, if you can't build on bedrock, you can either drive piles down into the ground like they did over in Lagoonsville, or you can build a foundation beneath the structure to distribute the weight. They did that, just poorly, so within the first five years of work it began tipping to the north by a fraction of a degree, so the builders compensated by angling the stones in the opposite direction. This worked a little too well because the tower started tilting a degree in the other direction and wouldn't stop. For better and worse, the project went on hold in 1178 because of near constant wars amid Italian states. The hot rivalry of the day was between factions within the Holy Roman Empire, the Guelphs who supported the Pope and the Ghibellines who supported the Emperor up in Germany. Pisa was an imperial kiss-ass Ghibelline while their neighbors Genoa and Florence were God-fearing, Pope-loving Guelphs. Duh, I'm sorry. I don't know what came over me. I assure you that I ardently, viscerally, do not care about the investiture controversy. All that mattered is this caused two and a half centuries of war that got in the way of the pretty tower. I don't know why I weirdly felt so strongly about that all of a sudden. <laughs> Pisa's power ebbed in the 1200s, and even though construction resumed in 1272, it stopped again six years later when Genoa trounced them so badly it deleted the entire Pisa navy and permanently kicked our beloved tower town out of the Merchant Republic Club. The project was finally finished in 1372, at which point the builders tilted the belfry off of the tower's axis to make it level with the ground. All these compensating measures gave the tower a noticeable curve, but didn't prevent its tilt from worsening, leaning from 2.5 to 4.5 degrees off axis in the century after completion. This is, of of course, not great, but it would have been catastrophic if they built the whole thing in one go, because the soil was actually able to settle in each century between the phases of building and prevent what would have been total collapse otherwise. So, 199 years later, what had the Pisans built? Frankly, a knockout. We've all seen it a million times, but actually look at it and there's a lot here. The Campanile is an eight-level cylindrical tower with six stacked colonnaded balconies. Like the cathedral, all of this was clad in marble from all across the Mediterranean, brought back by Pisan merchants over the centuries. It's all close enough in palette that it harmonizes, but take a closer look and you'll see pinks, grays, and tans alongside the pale Carrera white. Per the design itself, describing it is somewhere between impossible and pointless, because there's not much to identify beyond the arches and columns and marble and progressively worsening case of the tilties, and yet this silly stack of stones achieves the absolute height of elegance. It's simple but not boring, clean but not flat. The freestanding columns bring a really nice play of light and shadow, and above all else, it's near perfectly proportioned. The tower is the same diameter as the nearby apse of the church, and the decorations intentionally match. The first floor has blind arches with these cute little diamond cutouts, and the upper story mirror the column balconies. It's subtle, but it really makes the whole thing work as a unit. Compare this against the baptistry. You can't put your finger on it, but it just feels kinda... off, right? That's what wacky proportions and mismatched decorations get you. So on its own, it's a very pretty tower. Paired with the cathedral, it's a gorgeous expression of Pisa's distinct identity. But if we zoom out and compare it to the rest of the Romanesque style, this is a staggering accomplishment. This was first designed in the 1100s when stuff like Santa Francesca in Rome was the height of fashion. It's not bad by any stretch, but come on, it's running on GameCube graphics in comparison. Pisa's tower looks more comfortable alongside Palladio's neoclassical handiwork from the 15 frickin' hundreds. Everyone's out here building stout-looking veneerless square towers with windows four centimeters wide, while Pisa is flexing with literally stacks on stacks on stacks of colonnades in Horrible. It's not even close, and frankly, it's not even fair. Pisa took inspiration from its contemporaries and spontaneously generated a completely new expression of Romanesque architecture that nobody else could match, let alone beat, until Renaissance neoclassical caught up 400 years later. And it's got that cute little lean? Game over, guys. Better luck innovating when gothic rolls in. You'll need it.
But of course, only after the tower was finally capped and finished did things really get wibbly. By 1800, the foundation sat six feet below ground level, and the geniuses in charge decided to excavate the base of the tower, giving them a lovely little walkway which flooded constantly and no longer had soil there to hold the damn thing in place. So by the 1900s, it was at five and a half degrees and in serious danger of collapsing. Successive governments spent decades investigating the soil and proposing fixes, but nothing got done until 1989 when a tower in Pavia collapsed, killing four people. People, so Italy finally got their acts together and came up with a rather ingenious solution. They temporarily stabilized the tower with 870 tons of lead weights while they drilled underneath it, removing over 1,300 cubic feet of soil one cubic foot at a time to gently cant it back under 4 degrees. This fix is calculated to give the tower another 300 years of life before more work is necessary. It's an astonishing feat of modern engineering that fulfills the tower's artistic accomplishment from 8 centuries ago. There are too many projects in history that are designed and never made, began but never finished, or completed only to one day come down. But here we see a feat of medieval artistry at the perilous edge of possibility. The soil analysis showed that just a 6% increase in height or weight would have rendered the tower mechanically impossible to stay standing. That's even after accounting for the soil settling between the construction phases that stopped it from toppling back in the 11 and 1200s. Yet, here in Pisa nonetheless stands the single most radically innovative piece of Roman esque architecture in Europe, immaculately designed, lovingly constructed, and miraculously preserved. I've never been so glad to be so wrong about architecture. Thank you so much for watching. As the tower's first foundations were laid in August of 1173, this year is the 850th anniversary of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. This video was a joy to work on, so I'm glad I got to spend my birthday earlier this month noodling away at this hilarious shitpost of a video. I'll see you in the next one.